uh, I started a, a Wolf Fire scholarship there. So a lot of students come in, they don't have any money to do extracurricular things or the things that a lot of times we take for granted, it's like they want to do the study, right? Most uh, American Indian underrepresented minority, you ask them, why did they come to college? They say, so I can go help my people, right? Um, and that, trust me, that is a burden, right? That is an extra burden to, to go through. It's like, I, I, I have to do this uh, so I can go back and, and help my communities. But it's also a motivational thing, right? And so we set up a scholarship to try to give uh, Native uh, researchers some money. That took about a year because you talk about money, you talk about academics, you talk about lawyers. It was a mess. Um, and then I wanted to start this thing called 100 Degrees by 2020. This was back in the early 2000s. Everything was 2020 then. I think it's 2030 now, isn't it? Yeah, 2030. Uh, if I started now, it would be 100 by 2030. And it was like, let's be purposeful about uh, graduating 100, I think it was, I forget what year, uh, and celebrating that, right? And showing that off that natives can come here and be successful. Uh, and then finally, social belonging interventions, right? Uh, I, I found out about this intervention that was done uh, in California. Uh, it was wrapped, oh, so let me, I'll come back to that. And so I had all this momentum going at the University of at, at Buffalo. And here was the provost. This is back when I didn't really know what a provost was. Um, I, and so um, uh, our first meeting, I was telling him everything that was going on. And he asked me, David, how come so many natives drop out of UB? And I said, sir, you shouldn't ask that question like that. You should ask the question, how come UB runs off so many natives, right? And his, the, the look on his face, and there, again, I didn't know what a provost was. Um, it was sort of shocking. And, uh, but anyway, he, he and I sort of hit it off. And so this is my research center, Native American Center for Wellness Research. We were doing a fundraiser. He came there. He spoke. He says, yes, we are going to invest in all of these great things. Uh, we're going to do all the right things. And then a couple of months later, I got this news article that he became the president of Binghamton. Uh, and he just left me at the altar. Um, and so um, I thought, okay, I, I just, I, I learned the hard lesson of turnover in academics. Um, and so I have to continue on. This, this idea of social belonging, social belongingness, people feeling like they belong somewhere. If you walked into this room and nobody made you feel welcomed here, would you stay here? If you walked into a party and nobody made you feel welcome or acknowledged your presence, would you stay there? Probably not. There's this idea that a sense of belongingness uh, on a college campus helps with persistence. When, when students feel like they belong somewhere, they stay somewhere. Does that make sense? Uh, so Walton and Cohen did this study in 2007, but it was a deceptive study, okay? Okay. Uh, I read an article, or I saw uh, uh, a show about uh, the Unabomber, and they say part of the reason why he blew up uh, academics because they, he was involved in a deceptive study, and he felt very offended. I don't know if there's a, a you know a true line there to his behavior, but I, I have I, I have the belief that we shouldn't be deceiving minority students, right? I, I just don't believe that. And what this study did is that uh, they would bring in, it was basically with African Americans, they would bring in uh, first year African American students and say, you know what, you are a success. And you are such a success, you need to tell the next group of students coming in uh, what they need to do and why you were successful, right? And so the, the student under that story would sit down and say, oh, do this. I've done this. You do this. Under the impression, it's like, I'm a success, and now I get to help somebody else be successful. When in reality, that writing down, that talking about why you were su successful was the intervention. That student wasn't helping him. They didn't transfer that on to the next uh, freshman cohort. Um, 
And I thought, oh my gosh, can you imagine finding out you thought you were helping somebody and then you realize, oh no, I wasn't. And imagine in, in sort of in my culture with natives, we, we take great pride in helping people and to be honorable and do honorable things and to be told you're helping somebody only to find out you helped yourself. Um, I thought, no, I can't do this deceptive study. Other researchers had followed this path with uh, this social belongingness. Uh, and so what I did, the same folks who created this video uh, helped me create a video of my own. You are college material, you belong. And it's, it's a, in three acts. So I interview a cohort of students, both mixed minority and non-minority. Uh, the first act is about, I first came on college campus, I really feel like I didn't fit in. Right, I didn't, could, I didn't have any friends. I went from high school where I knew everybody to a college campus where I knew no one and I didn't know how to make friends, right? How, how do you negotiate that again, right? And then the second act was, oh my gosh, something happened. I met somebody. S something happened that changed my mind, right? The third act was, thank God I stayed, right? Thank God I stayed. And the, and the idea was, is just to put social belonging out there, is to say, is to normalize it. Every student who walks on campus fills out a place when they first get here. Trust me, when I walked on this campus, I, I, I look around this campus and still do, I see these young, beautiful, bright students. I wouldn't be able to get into WashU. I barely got into the, my public school, I got in. And uh, they're intimidating as hell. Um, it was like, and so I used to compare my insides to people's outsides, right? And even this group, my gosh, you're a beautiful bunch, right? And so I would have this anxiety of like, oh my gosh, I do not fit into this place. And this is what happens with every college campus, regardless if you're a minority or a non-minority, every student feels this way, right? Uh, and so at Forest Park, uh, I got them to work with me. They are a high underrepresented minority student body. They had a retention rate of about 56%. And uh, so what I did, it was a very loose start. I didn't have any money. Uh, and so I had, a, they have a, a freshman class uh, seminar. It's required for all freshman students, like a prep class. And so I had a coalition of the willing, the teachers allowed me to come into their class, about half of them. And so I went into about half of their class and I showed them this video. It was a 15 minute, it was a 13 minute video. And then we had a 15 minute conversation about, does anybody feel like they don't belong here, right? And amazingly, students started to talk. And then they all realized, oh geez, we all sort of feel the same way. It was their first semester about three weeks in, right? And they looked around and was like, I'm no different than anybody else. So I did this with about uh, half that group from the fall. I did it in the fall and I waited till spring and I, and I waited to see who re-enrolled. So between the experimental and control group, about 11% difference, right? A th a basically a 45 minute one-time intervention uh, produced this 11% retention boost, right? Now, a year prior, the community college had did this year-long intervention uh, to try to increase retention. They had like a 3 or 4% increase, and they, it was printed like, oh, my God, this was the greatest thing in the world, and it took a whole semester to get it done, right? Uh, surprisingly, also, the group that, uh, the experimental group also had a higher boost in GPA. I don't know why that is, but just if... You might know it's, it's uh, easy to lower your GPA. It is hard to raise it. Right? Uh, recently, in last year, I got a little bit of money from a very generous man in my department, Michael Schroden, uh, that allowed me to pay uh, students to be involved in the research, right? So it was about $20,000. And this time I did a random control trial, the strongest sort of design uh, in our industry. And so there, I enrolled about, uh, enrolled 207 people, 105 in the experiment where they got the intervention, 103 in the control. They got a 
uh, they got a similar uh, time spent with them, but it was about an education. It's like, here's what's on campus. Uh, they had these services, so it was an educational thing, right? Uh, from this, uh, from fall to spring, 17.4. Right? I thought, oh my gosh, right? So this paper is, uh, it's been written, it's been pitched uh, right now. And so a 45-minute intervention about hey, we are pretty much all alike, right? Uh, so some implications. So this intervention has significant, uh, so it has some really nice effects and, and outcome. Uh, unfortunately, it, it focuses on the students. It the, changes, uh, the, uh, changes the thoughts and the beliefs of the students. So I'm manipulating the seeds, right? Uh, imagine what would happen if a university overtly went out on a regular basis and made students feel comfortable. Imagine if our new chancellor, who I'm just meeting, walked into classes and said, hey, welcome, start, right? Especially where there's high minorities on this campus, which is low. Um, but imagine if there was an overt act to make every student feel welcome on this campus. Now, um, I have some data about dropouts on this campus. We have about a 95, I think, percent retention rate. There's about four or six percent dropout. Any guess who that population is? I won't have to say it. Um, so, uh, and so while this changing the seed uh, is a good thing, it seems like uh, what would be a great help if the attitudes and the policies of a, of a system of education uh, would, would change, right? Rather than changing individuals, could we change um, uh, the system? So, um, I know this was a pretty tough thing to watch. Um, um, I've I, I greatly appreciate uh, you guys sitting through this. Um, this is a this is a very important uh, sort of topic to me. Uh, and what's going on currently is is like um, who deserves an education, right? And who gets in? Uh, and um, it just quickly as I wrap up here, uh, I'm also looking at the front end of uh, who gets in. And research knows how students fail. There's a lot of research about failure and how to avoid failure. I did a brief study where I asked successful minority students, I asked one question, what was the main reason you succeeded in higher education? Right? Uh, three different groups, African-American, Hispanic, Native American. And they all three centered around three outcomes. Somebody believed in me and helped me. Somebody on campus believed in me and helped me. And I had some level of motivation to do well. Right? And how do we judge people and how do we get into a university? GRE, how smart we are, <laughs> our test taking, right? None of those success responses were ever mentioned on how the, the industry decides who gets in this program and other programs across the country. Right. And so uh, I greatly appreciate it. I'm happy to take uh, some questions and um, stay here as long as you like. Great talk. I had a question about, uh, so you talked about two studies at the end, and the second study you said was a randomized control trial. What made the first study not randomized and controlled? How was well, that run? Uh, yes. Uh, the first study 
Uh, so they have these bank of courses, these uh, freshman courses, and I forget there were 10 maybe. And uh, so I just, I was just meeting them and the, the leader there said, let's just fi fi find five professors who allow you to come into their class for an hour, right? And so the first five that said yes, I went into that class. And then administratively, they had a, the other group that they didn't get anything, right? And so we just watched uh, those move on. So the, really the, uh, the comparison group got nothing. So the second uh, study is that they, they both got something, right? So you could say on the first one, it wasn't, it wasn't random, right? It was self-selected by the professor. And they got something, right? A, you know what I mean. Uh, sometimes a placebo or something helps, right? The second study was total random, random, and each group got something. That was a long answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did that make sense? Thank you. I'd like to make a remark rather than ask a question, but I hope you'll respond to it. Okay. Uh, you, uh, I am so passionate about the subject that you're talking about, I hardly know uh, where to start. I'm so touched by what you presented to us. Um, I'm a retired physician and I've seen lots of people who have suffered lots of trauma. In my profession, this became known as, from a scientific standpoint in 1987. And you might comment on this article if you're familiar with it. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. It was published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in 1987, the principal author was Vincent Folletti. It started at the Kaiser Permanente Health Foundation. And what they found out by accident was that trauma in childhood, meaning before the age of 18, has lifelong consequences, the most serious of which is a premature death of anywhere from 20 to 25 years. The, tr the science of trauma has grown enormously. And the studies that you, you've mentioned um, are uh, comparable to uh, uh, other studies which are ubiquitous in the trauma field. To make it more accessible to this audience, you mentioned your part Cherokee and your part hillbilly. I'd like to make a suggestion to the audience that they read J.D. Vance's Hillbilly Elegy, if they're not already familiar with it. And one of the chapters in there, uh, he references the Adverse Childhood Experiences study explicitly and explains how he grew out of his childhood trauma um, and eventually achieved success. I'd also like to mention uh, your, your colleague, uh, Michael Sheradden, came up with a technique for helping people succeed and tell them that they have value, which is the, the creation of an individual development account, which you might comment on. And finally, when people walk out of the door, if they're as touched as I am, that there's something that they can do. There's an organization. It's a national organization. And St. Louis happens to play a leadership role throughout this country. And it's called Alive and Well Communities. 
and it recognizes the lifelong effects of adverse childhood experiences them uh, experiences and has a myriad programs that it's developed to address these in in ways quite comparable to what you're talking about all they have to do if anybody wants to do anything about it when they walk out the room just google alive and well communities and get involved with the program thank you I'm wondering whether WashU has an outreach program where not just in St. Louis, but out of state even, that they go to high schools, whether on reservations, um, and not just a one-time thing, but develop relationships um, where you know there would be a pool where they cultivate and develop the young people so that Wash you becomes a possibility for them. Hi, thank you so much for your lecture. I really appreciate it. I'm a graduate of this university and also part Cherokee. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask you a little bit about finding the native voice. <clears throat> and you know, so often when we think about this trauma, we, um, and the impacts, as, as you've um, shared about the trauma, the silencing of the native voice, you know, through the boarding schools. And even today, it's not cool to have a native voice, right? <coughs> Other groups, it seems to be um, more prolific, I would say, accepted, appreciated. Um, but sometimes I hear people th say things about native culture and Native Americans almost as if 
well, you have a reservation, you get funds, what's the problem now? You know, how do we find that voice after that amount of su suppression, you know, and help everyone to hear the voice of, of people today and the students who are here and to help them know it's, it's okay and appreciated. Um, I know that some of the former boarding schools are still being run today, although not administered by the U.S. government, and I actually give money to one of them. So can you speak at all to the current state of boarding schools specifically for Native American children, I guess, in general?
Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate what you're presenting to us today. I work in education, and even in, what is this, 2019, that it's still appalling that our young people still can't seem to find the right balance of information when they're learning about the cultural diversity in the United States and beyond. And uh, they are stuck still, some of them to this day, in the stereotypes of many peoples, you know, that they just can't seem to let that mindset go or open their hearts to it. Um, that's just kind of a personal observation. There is a film I came across called The Education of Little Bear. And it, Little Bear, or oh, was it Little Tree? Uh-oh, could be Little Tree. But yes, it was kind of, a, I guess, a different approach to the, bo the little boy had to go to the uh, boarding school and some of the experiences he had. I thought it was a wonderful film to kind of get that message across if no one was aware of that. And lastly, I work with a le youth leadership program, and many of the students came from really all over, and participants from the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma were there. And they had asked to have in the scheduling a session to meet and talk among themselves, because one of the principles was this was their opportunity to let the students talk about what they were doing in their schools and how they were feeling welcomed and, you know, growing and, you know, because the social media just kind of interrupts everybody's flow of, of real information but contact. So to see that in a lot of cases that's still ongoing within the communities, but I think there's still a long way to go to educate young people now and adults uh, about everything that you've talked about today. Thank you. Well, my youngest son, I think, was in the third grade, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the teacher instructed him to draw pictures for him and how comics tell songs in the third grade. And I don't know if you know how natives feel about drums. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have mixed feelings. Uh, and so, uh, and my son, my youngest son, I would say, is more sort of traditional native than into it. I came to it after I changed my life around. That's the difference between the two things. So uh, anyway, he was, he was he was like, what are you doing, son? And anyway, he pulled out the picture and he said, look. I said, what picture? What are you doing with these pictures? He said, look at Columbus. And I'm like, dang, it looks pretty good. He's like, maybe the unibrow. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here today and join me in thanking David for a wonderful time. <laughs>